This time we want to cover beehive products. First one we'll look at is honey. That's the most common uh, product of the beehive. And honey is derived from nectar. Nectar is gathered from the flowers. By the bees from nectar bearing flowers. Now not all flowers produce nectar but some do and it, the nectar is there as an attractant to the bees to encourage the bees to come to the flowers which in the process causes pollination. The bees gather the nectar from the flower and the nectar is 80% water. It is the balance of 20% of sucrose and, and other minor proteins. The ripening process of honey from nectar to honey is caused by the bee. The bee gathers the nectar and in the process adds enzymes to the nectar. The enzymes in the nectar break down the sugars from sucrose into honey which has fructose and glucose. Both sugars that humans can assimilate. So honey finally becomes the main sugars are fructose and glucose which our bodies can consume without pre-digestion. If we are to eat sucrose we have to digest it ourselves, add the enzymes ourselves and turn it into glucose before we can gain energy. By eating honey the, work, the bee has done the work for us and the honey, glucose and fructose will give humans instant energy. So honey is the main product of the beehive, as most beekeepers in the world are honey producers. But there are other, other products also that the bees produce, and the other one is pollen. Pollen is the protein food. of bees. Honey is the energy food. So bees must have honey and pollen. The protein value of pollen is exceptionally high. It has the 23 elements of the human body, all vitamins and all minerals required by the bees are in flower created pollen. Again this means bees not only gather honey and cause pollination while they're gathering honey, they also gather pollen for their own food consumption which again creates pollination of plants. So honey bees are the greatest pollinators on earth. They're the greatest insect pollinators we have. And our whole human race really depends on the pollination of all our fruit crops by honey bees as the major pollinating insect. All countries developing a beekeeping industry should be doing it for that aspect alone. They should be developing a beekeeping industry to enhance their production of agricultural crops and food crops for humans using the pollination from the honey bees to enhance their production of crop. Honey really in the world is a byproduct. Pollination is the greatest gift that bees have for, for humankind. We can harvest the pollen and it's, it, it comes in a granule form which is gathered straight from the flower. That is also consumable by humans 
although our bodies don't have the ability to break it down completely uh, and utilize it fully because it's a bit like a grain of wheat or a seed it has a very hard shell and it's reasonably difficult for our bodies to digest but it is also still a very good uh, supplement health food for humans and uh, this is trapped from the bees under special traps. It's, it's freeze dried and packaged and processed and sold in some markets around the world as a health food. So it's, it's quite uh, uh, palatable to eat and, and very good for you as a, as, a, as a diet supplement. So that's the bees food, that and honey and water. A hive of bees requires honey, pollen and water for survival. The other product that uh, a uh, bee produces is beeswax. Now this is raw beeswax as the bees have produced it. Wax is essentially a fat. So if you boil this in water it will homogenize and, and disintegrate. So if you, but if you heat it gently in water, it'll come to a liquid and then it'll return into a solid. So wax is a byproduct of beekeeping. In, in our processing of honey, extraction of honey, we gain quite a bit of wax. Now wax has got a value uh, at present of about $4.50 uh, per kilogram of bulk wax. So it's another byproduct income for beekeepers. So they should save their the surplus wax and it's got a market. The use, for wax, the use for beeswax, apart from beekeepers, beeswax is used by beekeepers to make our comb foundation. The wax foundation that we looked at earlier is created by melting and milling this in a machine to turn into these sheets of wax. These sheets of wax are used by all beekeepers as the foundation for new combs in their hives. So this is natural beeswax which the bees can now build on and make a honeycomb. The other use for beeswax, the secondary use for beeswax in the world is for candles for the Catholic Church predominantly because the Catholic Church uh, has used candles, beeswax candles because it's pro produced by a virgin bee, it's produced by a worker bee and it's the purest form of wax on earth so therefore it has been used extensively through the Catholic Church for, for altar candles and for church candles so that's been a big user. The next big user of beeswax is the cosmetics industry. All lipstick Face creams, hair creams, many, many of those products, cosmetic products, are based on beeswax because beeswax is safe on your skin, it's good for your skin, it's non-toxic, and it's a very good base substance for, for most cosmetics. Apart from that, you can make furniture polish, you can make uh, shoe polish, you can make candles for your use at home, uh, you can use it for uh, putting in baking trays to stop uh, bread sticking to a, to a tray. The biscuit industry in Fiji uses a lot of this to, to coat their biscuit trays uh, to, as, a, as a release agent so the biscuits don't stick. So there's, there's many uses for, for beeswax and it's, it's, a, it's a very good universal product. It's safe to eat, it's non-toxic and so therefore it's a, it's a very valuable product or a byproduct of bees and not many people know the, the value of it. So you've got beekeepers, candles, cosmetics, and polish. If you want to make that into a liquid, you can mix it with turpentine. Mineral turpentine and beeswax will liquefy the beeswax. And then you can use it as a wood polish for polishing tables, furniture, or your boots or shoes. So it's very simple. And again, probably a useful product uh, in rural areas where, where access to, to uh, wood polishers and shoe polishers and things like that may be limited. Uh, people in, the, in a village environment could make good use of this for candles and for a shoe polish and for polishing timber.
So uh, particularly making artifacts and things like that, people use a lot of this sort of thing for polishing artifacts for sale to tourists. So those are the, the, the number three. There's a fourth product which is propolis. And propolis is, this is a, a tincture of propolis which has been broken down into a liquid form where it can be used by humans. Propolis is is produced by the bees and used by the bees to protect themselves against infection in the hive. The bees gather the propolis resins from buds of trees they bring it back to their hive and they coat everything in their hive with propolis. And even every time an egg or a bee hatches from a frame, the, the cell that the bee hatched from is coated with propolis to sterilize it before the next bee goes in. Now if you think about honeybees, they go outside, they get contaminated, they crawl all over each other inside the hive, they feed each other, they are in a situation without a very good antibiotic system or a, a disease control system within their hives, they could not exist. 50,000 bees in, in one unit couldn't exist for very long. If we put humans in that concentration, we, we couldn't survive. Bees have learned to survive through the use of propolis. Every part of the hive is coated with propolis. Propolis is antibacterial. anti-viral and anti-fungal. So no bacteria, virus or fungus can live in this product. My spelling might be a bit, yeah, anti-fungal. So we get we can extract this product from the hive as a byproduct. It is good for treatment of wounds externally, internally in humans. It's sophisticated in its process, but the actual production and collection of the raw material from the hives is within the reach of every beekeeper. So we, we buy the raw material from the hives here at about $80 a kilogram. So it's another byproduct that beekeepers can get from their hives apart from honey. They can save their wax and they can, they can scrape the surplus propolis from their hives and bring that in for sale as well. And uh, we, we can then process it on into a, a, a product which is used for human consumption. So they are, they are the main honey, pollen, wax and propolis are the main products of the hive. There are other things that you can eat. You can eat the bees if you want to and you can produce royal jelly and, and several other products from a hive which are probably not significant in, in the beekeeping groups that we're talking about. It's probably uh, technologically outside of the area at this stage. So that basically wraps up what I've got to say about bee products. Uh, but honey sure, certainly is the the most easy to produce and the most profitable part of beekeeping for beekeepers. Uh, these other products are byproducts which may add to that income, but most beekeepers would concentrate on honey production. And the good quality honey is what the world needs. There's a shortage of honey worldwide, so the demand for honey is increasing and the population is increasing as well. So there's uh, Every, there's a good market potential for honey for, for a long time to come. I explained previously that bees gather nectar from the flowers. They bring it back as nectar, which is 80% moisture. They then dry it by fanning air through their hive and when they've reduced the moisture to as low as they can get, approximately 18%, they then seal the honey over. It's, it's then considered ripe and 
that is the honey that we can harvest. Once it's been sealed over the honey, that tells us the honey is ready for consumption. And that's how the bees store it in their hives as their food source. Uh, once they've dried it and sealed it, it will keep for a year or more in the hive and as the bees require more food supplies, they can break that open and utilize it for food. So bees store honey basically for the, the uh, periods of the year when there's no available fresh nectar coming in. And so they, they store against the bad weather of future. So hives must always have a certain amount of honey in them, three or four frames of honey. Beekeepers in harvesting honey from their hives should always be aware that the honey is the food supply of the bees and they should never take all of the honey out of the hive. They should always leave three or four, equivalent of three or four frames of honey in a, in a hive to supplement the bees to make sure that they can survive until the next honey flow comes. The other thing we can do is we can supplement feed with sugar, which we'll be covering in, a, in another issue. Removal of honey is a relatively simple process. You need a smoker, keep control of the bees. The, the biggest risk you run in, in removing honey is causing robbing. Bees are made to find honey, and uh, if you spill honey on the ground or, or, or leave honey uncovered, bees in the apiary will find it and they will start robbing. Now this is one of the biggest risk factors in beekeeping probably in being successful or not. Uh, when you're dealing with honey particularly you must be fairly quick, you bring it out and if possible sweep the bees back into the hive using a brush, putting it into a box and covering it. So it must be covered at all times. The other thing is to keep your smoke, you can drive a lot of bees down with the smoke and keep them under control. We split them out and quickly brushing the bees off back into the hive. Take it across, put it into our spare box. Cover it and repeat the process. Sometimes you can shake a large number of bees off and then just sweep the odd ones. Back out, back into our box, pushing them up and covering it. Until we've removed all of the surplus honey. So if we work quickly and take our honey and cover it, and then as soon as we've completed, we've taken all the honey we want to take, then it is important to close the hive down. And you can leave that open like that with an empty box. That's not a problem. While we put that back on, we cover it. And that seals the hive again. We can now take this box away for the extraction. Once it's extracted, the honey is extracted from the frames, then we can return those frames back to the hive again and wait again for the next accumulation of honey before we harvest again. Now harvesting doesn't happen every month, honey comes in seasonally and in, in Fiji particularly most of the honey starts in May, June, July, August, September, October. This is the winter months for temperate climates but it's the honey production season for the tropical climates. Our wet season is our low season which is October, November, December, January and February and March. That's when we have high rainfall, high humidity and bees don't work. Through that period we often supplement feed with dry sugar to make sure our hives survive through that period so they'll give us a good harvest through the what we call a dry season. So it's the dry season that is the honey season in the tropics. The wet season is the most difficult period for managing the bees and keeping them alive. So we would expect these hives to produce 25, 30 kilos over the next four to five months. Our best production in Fiji is about 50, our worst is about 15 kilos per hive in a dry year. Our best production has been around 65 kilos per hive on a good year. And that's basing our 
records over the last nine years. We budget and recommend on a basis of about 25 kilos per hive as, a, as an economic uh, production level. And over nine years, our own hives would have exceeded that uh, an average of about 30 to 35 kilos. The best recorded production we have in Fiji is on one of the outer islands of Thuthia, where they've produced up to 100 kilos per hive in one year. So that's exceptionally high honey production. So there is vast variations in, in microclimates and different districts and different areas within, within, a, within a country. So again, we can't determine whether bees will work very well in certain areas until we put bees there. The only true answer to find out the production of the potential of an area is to put some bees there and wait a year or two and test that area. So what we do in our business in a commercial sense is that we have say 25 or 30 different apiary sites. Every year we record the production from those sites. The best sites are recorded and the worst sites are recorded. What we do is we eliminate some of the worst sites and move them into the areas where the best sites are. And that way we make continuously upgrade our production figures and maintain a higher average all the time by, by using the best areas. So uh, that's something that will come with time with beekeepers. Most beekeepers in this country have got one apiary in their own location. And in generally, generally, they will provide a very good income at 25, 30 kilos a hive. The exceptional areas are microclimates in different, different locations around the country. So that's basically uh, the transportation of honey. We're using a wheelbarrow here. You can use a pickup truck. Uh, to transport the honey, we put a, a drip tray underneath. Now that's a sealed tray, which means no honey dripping from the frames is going to go in the barrow or on the ground and be attractive to bees. On top we have what we call a split board or an inner cover and we put that over the top to make it completely bee proof. So if you follow those rules in removing honey, you'll have no problem with robbing. You must then take this away to a bee proof location to do the extraction. You can't extract honey out here in the apiary because if you brought an extractor out here and started extracting, all of the bees would go crazy. And this has happened on occasion in villages where people don't understand the nature of robbing. And uh, this is a mistake that has happened. And so therefore I'd like to reinforce that you must take the honey away to a bee proof area. If you're doing it in a location where you haven't got a good bee proof building with fly screen windows, you can take it in late in the evening, extract it at night and return the frames to the hive and settle it down and wash up and clean up in the building before morning and that way you won't have bees robbing in the building in, in the morning. So that's the other way around it to compromise. Do your extraction at night when the bees are asleep. Right, this process of uh, extraction of honey begins with removal at the hive and we cover the, the frames and we've removed the bees and we've got some frames of honey here that are sealed. Now, when honey is ready for harvesting, it needs to be sealed over and you can see there with breaking the seal, the honey is released. There's two tools here. One is a scratcher, which we can, we can use to break the surface of the comb, which is reasonably effective to take the, the cappings, wax off the top, or we can use a knife, which is an uncapping knife. This knife is used in this action in the sawing action and this removes the the wax from the surface of the comb. It's a matter of, of uh, cost and preference uh, which, which tool is used 
the, the knife here is a cold knife and in the tropics the combs and the honey are generally fairly warm so we don't need to have to worry about preheating the combs for, for extraction. Uh, the honey will readily extract it at, at room temperature. Now the next process, the cappings and the, and the honey are in this basket and this is draining the honey from that wax so we don't waste the honey, we, we, we save that honey and then we also can retrieve that wax. The next step is to put this into the honey extractor. And that places in a, in a basket which secures that frame. We then proceed with more. Now this is a frame that is difficult to uncap with a knife and so therefore this scratcher is useful for finishing off the areas that the knife can't reach satisfactorily to make sure all of the cells are open to release the maximum amount of honey. And we can, we can with a comb like this, we can just work our way down and take the surface cappings off to release the honey. This is being uh, placed in here until we get four. Honey at this stage is ready to eat. We find in, in Fiji, most beekeepers use these. Uh, it's, it's cheaper and it's, it's satisfactory to do that. To have a knife is, is a lot more expensive, but you still also require this as well. But you can do the whole job with this if, uh, if that is all you've got. So these are now placed one in each basket, which holds four frames. Now the principle of this machine is a centrifugal force Spinning the frames will remove the honey and throw the honey from the cones. This, this particular extractor has a safety feature here where you must push the handle in to engage it to drive. Once it's engaged, then we can rotate the frames. Now this rotation process doesn't need to be extremely fast. And if you can look down in there, you can see the honey coming out on the wall of the extractor. This is particularly about 540 revs uh, a minute this extractor should go and that's, that's about the speed we're doing now. So it's not, a, uh, it's not important to spin it very fast, it's just a consistent spinning. You can see now I can release that and the handle's not flying around. The honey will take about two minutes to extract each side of the frames. When this comes to rest again, we can remove the frames and we can, the honey is removed from that side, we return it back and reverse it round. So the frame is taken out, turned round, so that the honey side is there, the empty side is inside now. So we quickly replace these. repeat the process.
engage the handle and spin the honey again. Again the honey is coming out from the other side of the frame. So this extractor is doing one side and then the other side. This is a hand operated plant, uh, particularly designed for, for village use where they don't have power. A full frame of honey can yield up to about two kilos of honey. These are not particularly good frames of honey because of this time of the year, our honey production, this is not our honey production season. Uh, but generally, they, the frames are much fuller and a full frame of honey can even hold as much as two and a half kilos of honey. So from one of these frames, you can extract two and a half kilos of honey. You can see now that the comb is empty, the honey has been removed. These combs now can go back to the hive and the bees can repair, refill and use them over and over again. So from here, we remove the frames again and place them back in our box. Ready for transporting back to the hives and we repeat the process over until we've completed our honey extraction. The, the tools we keep in cold water, and that's a point we should emphasize here, when you finish this operation, wash all your equipment out with cold water. Let it soak in cold water. Uh, that will prevent fermentation starting. By using hot water, you can often activate the yeasts in the honey and the residue of water and honey in the, in the machine or in the container can set up fermentation. So it's best to just soak it in cold water, rinse it thoroughly, and then put the apparatus out in the sun, out in the bright sun to dry out thoroughly before you bring it inside for storage. How to deal with our cappings. Our cappings wax now is, is in, a, in this basket, and the honey draining from that, you can either hang this like this, overnight or you can hurry it up by by squeezing it out by just winding it up until you get the honey removed the last honey from the wax removed and let it drain into the into the uh, base so the honey in the cappings is still good quality honey and you don't lose you don't lose any honey if you allow it to drain. As this container fills, we then can drain the honey from here. <coughs> this is a, a, a honey gate which is sealed, and the honey, we need to tip it forward a slightly here to get it to run. This gate also can shut and tighten, which, which seals it from, from leakage. Right, we now take this honey, and we go across to our, to our storage tank. Now, our storage tank, it's a small tank, I'll just remove this lid. And again, we put another filter in the top. This is, is what is known as mutton cloth. It's a tubular material which is available quite readily in Fiji. So all we do is tie a knot in that end and we place it over this basket to form another filter. Once we have our filter in place, then we can take our honey and we can pour it down again through the filter. And that will go completely drained. And that again will give the honey a second filtration to make sure there's no particles of wax and things still in the honey to get a good quality honey for the market. 
The same with the honey in the honey extractor. The process is the same here. As the honey extractor fills with honey, we can release the honey again into a bucket. And that honey also gets blended through here, through the filtration. You'll notice in the honey there's particles of wax, little bits of wax that come off the frames when we're extracting. And this is what we need to get through our filter here to make sure all of those particles of wax still in the honey are removed to get a pure, clean honey. Once we've lowered the level of that sufficiently, then we can close that off and we can replace that with, with another bucket to catch any drips. And the same process with our bucket here, we can remove now, take back to this position and with this again we can filter the remaining honey. So we now have pure honey being filtered ready to eat. And this is one of the the uh, features of, of beekeeping in, in Fiji is the producer is empowered all the way to the marketplace. He not only produces the product, he can extract the product, he can filter the product and he can finally bottle the product uh, to, to make it a, a saleable item. So to bottle it again is the same process uh, with being careful just to lift this gate a, a small amount, you can, you can regulate the flow of honey coming from it. Good idea to have a, a damp cloth just to, to wipe up any, any drips, which invariably happens. We now have a bottle of honey on which we can put a sealed cap. These have got a safety seal in the cap, these bottles, so we know that they've not been tampered with in the marketplace, and therefore we can now, with pride, sell our bottle of honey. An important thing to remember is that when you filter the honey, when the honey goes through the filter, it also incorporates a certain amount of air in the honey. To remove that air, you need to leave this tank of honey to settle for about two to three days preferably before you bottle it. That, in that time, the air will rise to the surface of the honey and form bubbles and foam. You bottle off the honey down to leaving always an inch in there. That honey that's left over can be run into a bulk container and then put through the extraction machine next time you extract honey and blend it back in and filter it out again. So you don't waste it, but you don't necessarily pack all of the honey in the tank at one time. You maintain the last amount of honey in a container for use for putting through the system next time you extract honey and that way you can keep recycling and keep it going forever. So that's the important feature here is to settle the honey for two or three days before you actually bottle the honey. If you're doing a lot of honey and your, your tank's over full, you can then store the honey You can store the honey in a container such as this here. 
you can just run it off into larger containers. Fill them and bulk the honey off. Then when you want to pack the honey, you return these containers of honey one at a time to your tank, settle it for two days, bottle it, then tip the next one, settle it for two days and bottle it. And that way you'll have a, a nice product with, with nice clear top, no foam or froth around the top of the honey. Uh, you'll always have a nice presentable bottle of honey. The, the foam in many cases is only ear bubbles, but it, it detracts from the marketplace. Uh, customers look at it and think there's something wrong if they see white foam on the top. It may only just be air bubbles, but to prevent that, a simple system, you can do it with a simple system, this is what I'm trying to say, and get the same quality of honey that a, a big commercial plant would do. But you have to take the right steps. Now, to conclude, uh, we, we're left with our wax still in, in, in uh, the, the filter cloth. Most of the honey is drained. So what we can do with that is then place it in a bucket of water and just soak it in cold water and leave it there to soak for probably 24 hours. After 24 hours the honey in the wax will have been absorbed into the water and you will be left with just the cappings wax. The cappings wax is pure beeswax and it is a a valuable byproduct of the beehive, so it uh, can be can be melted uh, in the village and made into candles, or it can be just sold to a uh, beekeeping company as as bulk wax. Now, what we end up with here is particles of wax with the honey removed. So that's just particles of wax that's come from the comb. What we can do with that now is drop that into warm water and heat it until it turns to a liquid. But don't boil the water. Just heat it gently and simmer the water until the wax particles will actually go into a liquid and form and disappear completely. In the, in the process, the pieces of cocoon and other, other uh, exterior matter in it will, will drop into the water and the wax will float on the top. You leave it then for 24 hours to go cold and the wax will solidify in a cake on the top and you'll end up being able to harvest that wax then you can reprocess and use that as well. So nothing is wasted uh, in the process. We can, we can save all of the honey and we can save the wax. Uh, all the products of the hive are marketable. What we want to demonstrate here is a, is a simple method of, of processing honey for, for packaging uh, to give it more shelf life or, or storage ability. Now honeys, particularly in the tropics, tend to be reasonably high in moisture and moisture and honey uh, present problems with fermentation. If honey has got uh, 20 or 21 percent moisture in it, it is prone to going sour and fermenting. Now the two principal problems are one is the high moisture, the other is the honey does contain airborne yeasts which are present in the atmosphere all the time. So to overcome this problem uh, in, in sophisticated industries we use sophisticated plant but in uh, a developing environment like here we haven't got the access to that sort of plant but we still need to maintain a quality product in the market because if we spoil the quality of our honey and we put substandard honey on the market we will eventually spoil our markets also and that will then open up the markets to uh, imported honeys being more favoured by the customer than the local product because of the quality control. So to get round this quality control thing we've had to devise very simple methods of uh, arriving at the same quality, but
but at very simple technology. And one of the, one of the, the systems that we've developed here actually dates back to, to very early times of beekeeping in New Zealand that I know of, uh, when conditions there were the similar to what they are here a hundred years ago. And a simple method of, of uh, processing honey for, for bottling and for marketing is to put the honey in a 20 litre steel container, place it on two concrete blocks on a concrete floor and put underneath a 40 watt light bulb. 20 litres of honey, 40 watts of light bulb. Don't be tempted to put a 75 or 100 and speed it up. The principle here is we want a very slow heat over a long time. And by putting a 40 watt light bulb, that will provide enough heat to slowly heat the honey in this container over 24 to 36 hours. That will drive off surplus moisture because Honey is heavier than water. Water will rise to the surface of the honey. The heat gently permeating through the honey will drive off some of the surplus moisture and reduce the moisture content. The other thing it does, if you can bring this honey up to about 40 degrees or 45 Celsius, then that also will destroy the surface yeasts, the airborne yeasts in the honey which may activate and cause fermentation. So you're doing two things, you're reducing the moisture, you're destroying the yeasts, therefore the honey will have very good quality. It will keep for long periods of time in bottles in shops without fermenting or pressurising bottles and things that honey does if it isn't processed. So this in a village can be easily constructed, particularly if you've got power. If you haven't got power there is other ways of doing this by heating this in a uh, another container full of water and slowly heating it that way. But for our, for our purposes here, this is a very simple, low technology, but very effective way of treating honey and stabilizing it so that it will be a good quality product in the marketplace. Once this is set up, the honey is placed in there. Over top, we place a large cardboard box. There's no fire risk with this basically because there's very little heat in there. And on the top, we can put some sacking or something like that to, to provide a bit of extra insulation. And leave that there for 24 to 36 hours. 36 hours is probably better. Uh, that will slowly heat the honey. Honey can be heated, but must be heated slowly. If you heat honey too fast, it'll caramelize, it'll burn, and you'll spoil its flavor. If you heat honey very, very slowly, you can bring it up to temperature, destroy the yeasts, and reduce the moisture content. So this is a low technology system which is applicable in all of the South Pacific Islands, particularly where we have a problem with high moisture honeys. Uh, this is something prone to the tropics because our humidity is high, the bees aren't able to dry the honey to very low levels, and so therefore this is another added insurance of maintaining the quality of our product in tropical countries and that, that quality of honey then will meet any honey that's being imported as, as similar quality. This section we want to look at the, the marketing of honey. This is the final result of all your labour. You've uh, worked your hives well, you've produced a good crop of honey and you've maintained a good quality product. The main step now is we've got this product in a bottle ready for marketing. Now the presentation of your honey, the image that you create will go a long way to building the honey sales for your particular business. And while you are in a small beekeeping business Honey sales won't be that difficult because you'll have a large customer base and a small amount of product. But as your business grows, you'll have to learn and think more about marketing your honey in a more professional manner. So you may as well start with those principles. The two most popular sizes of honey in Fiji we have found with our company are these two products. 
One is a 500 gram bottle and it's a flip top squeeze type bottle which is very convenient for people and particularly in the tropics because it doesn't attract the ants, it's protected when the lid is shut. Now most island countries have many ants and pests and most people in these island countries don't have refrigerators uh, and so keeping honey in bottles is a very good method for the tropical countries. In many other uh, temperate climate countries honey is stored in, in smaller jars with big tops where people use knives and spoons. My experience in the tropics is people use a bottle because they can squeeze the honey out. And so that is something we learned in the tropics about packaging and marketing honey. It's better in a bottle, uh, a, neck, a narrow neck bottle where people can actually pour that honey out. So getting your honey to the bottle is important than your label. By law, in most countries, you will find that you need to put your name and address on the label. You need to have the weight of the honey. Honey is often sold in litres, in gallons, in other configurations. The correct method of selling honey is in kilograms and grams. Hence, this honey here is packaged, it's in a 750ml bottle, but it holds 1.1 kilograms of honey. That needs to be clearly stated on the label. The name and address of the producer needs to be on the label. The word honey needs to be in large print. Because when a person walks into a shop, they're looking for honey. They need to be able to see this honey label on the shelf. So the label needs to stand out. Your own personal brand names and things are important but not as important as the word honey. So that would meet the requirements legally. It is also barcoded for supermarket sales. It is name and address and net weight. This will be expensive for small beekeepers to start with. And an alternative to that is we have a simple label which just says pure honey and these can be bought for about 18 cents each and on that you can write your name and you can put the weight of the honey and you can use these labels on various sized bottles so for a, for a beginner beekeeper, small beekeeper the beekeepers we're talking about are beekeepers with between 10 and 50 hives of bees and so therefore they don't have the, the, uh, the income to support perhaps large volume expensive labels but there's other ways of meeting the legal requirements and still presenting your product very well. Honey generally will keep very well as long as the moisture content is right and it's packed in an airtight bottle it will keep for up to 12 months quite safely on the, on the shop floor. So therefore, pre pre preparation of your honey, presentation of your honey, if those things are done right, your market will, will grow because your customer will be happy. So customers first are going to see your label, then they're going to taste your honey. If they like what they find, they'll come back for more and they'll find that label. So your label and identifying yourself is very important. We have, we have our honey presented and we now have to consider selling. Now selling honey is, is not as simple as it may sound. You have either a domestic market, which would be selling in a village for instance. You have a, a wholesale market.
which would cover supermarkets and shops and then you have the retail so if we start off in the village we can sell a limited amount at retail price now this is where most of our small 10 to 50 hive beekeepers are selling their honey so for a small beekeeper in the village, selling the honey at retail price is, is very profitable because they get the margin of the supermarket of the wholesaler and they're getting the retail margin plus in many cases they're not paying VAT tax and they can use simple containers and simple labels, they can cut the cost a wee bit here too. So if we look at honey at wholesale, if honey is selling say at $10 retail, it will only sell at $8 wholesale and it will be worth $6 back at the village. So this is what confuses a lot of new business people or small business people as to what their value of their honey is. The value of the honey in the village is $6 if they sold it to a company like ours in bulk. Because we have to package it, label it, filter it, bottle it and then sell it to a wholesaler for $8. The wholesaler, he takes it and puts it in his shop and he puts value added tax plus his markup on it and he sells it for $10. So this should clarify the difference between $6 and $10. Now, the domestic village beekeeper selling honey direct to his people can sell it quite readily at $10, which is the retail price of honey in the shops. So therefore, the profitability for the small domestic farmer is gone from $6 to $10, which is a very, very profitable small business. But you have to understand that as that business grows and you have a surplus of honey which you cannot sell locally, then you must look for a bulk market for honey. And a bulk market for honey will provide you with $6 a kilo. $6 a kilo is around about world value of honey. $10 to $12 is, is, is normal retail at the moment. So what I'm trying to give you here is just a simple explanation of why prices of honey vary in different places. People come to our company and say, well, you're paying us $6, but I see it $12 in the shop. What you need to understand is the steps involved into getting to the shop.